Hello, and welcome back to Math 301 Combinatorics at CSU. Today's video is a bonus topic video on one of my favorite topics in combinatorics, which is partitions and their generating functions. So a partition of a positive integer n is just a way of writing n as a sum of other positive integers. As an example, the partitions of four, the, you know, we can, we can write four as a sum of other integers in a number of different ways. Um, you can just take four itself, that's one partition of four, that just has one sum end. But then you can also write it as say three plus one, that's an example of a partition of four. And you can write it as two plus two, you can also have more than two numbers, you can say two plus one plus one, or um, one plus one plus one plus one. And those are the, the five partitions of four. So as a convention, um, we write the sum ends as a list, um, lambda one through lambda k, rather than using plus signs everywhere, because we consider three plus one and one plus three to be the same partition of four. So the order of the sum ends doesn't matter. And so as a convention, we write the parts from greatest to least, because we might as well choose one particular order from, from greatest to least, lambda one greater than or equal to lambda two up to lambda k. And these lambda sub i numbers are called the parts of the partitions. So the sum ends here are called the parts. And if we write out each of these partitions of four as a tuple like this, we again, just write the, make sure the sum ends are in uh, weakly decreasing order. So four, three, one, two, 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 one, one, and one, 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 one. So those are the five partitions of four. So this being a combinatorics class, the first thing we might ask is how many partitions of n are there? Can we count them? So, um, so in this case, there were five, but let's, let's now uh, explore how we write down partitions um, and how we compute how many there are. So a Young diagram is a visual way of writing down a partition that sometimes comes in handy for studying them. So we can draw a partition in a very visual way, say it's lambda is the partition as a tuple, and you draw lambda sub i boxes in the i throw for all i. So for instance, if we have the partition five, two, one, one, we would draw five boxes in the bottom row and then two boxes in the next row and then one box above that and one above that. That, that encodes this tuple five, two, one, one. And we make the rows left justified just so that we line them up and we can really see the size of these parts decreasing as we go up um, as we go up the partition. Now you may see in some texts that um, books might write them sort of in the opposite direction. So the five would be on the top and then the two and then the one and then the one. And that's another common way of writing it. These are both perfectly good ways of drawing their partitions. This is called the French convention and this is called the English convention. There's also a Russian convention, uh, which is like sort of diagonal. There's lots of different ways of drawing them. An another convention I've seen is where you actually put dots in each of these squares and then you erase all the lines. So it's a row of five dots and then a row of two dots and then a row of one dot and a row of one dot. And the dots by themselves form what's called the Ferrer's diagram of drawing your partition. So as you're doing combinatorial problems involving partitions, sometimes it's useful to draw them like this rather than just having them in a tuple. It somehow is easier to visualize. Anyway, so let's, let's ask ourselves how many partitions of n are there? And you can, you can practice using those Ferrer di Ferrer's diagrams or English or French notation box diagrams to try to verify that the number of partitions of, of each number listed here is actually the number listed below. So let's write P of n to be the number of partitions of n. And so I've listed for n being zero through seven, what is P of n? We found for instance, P of four is five. And so that's that entry of the table, but then there are seven partitions of five and 11 partitions of six and 15 partitions of seven and so on. So even though we have a nice visual way of drawing them, we can write them as tuples, we can write them in all these different ways, there's actually no, no nice explicit formula for P of n. There are some recursive formulas, um, but there's, there's no, you know, the only known explicit formula involves some summations and it's not a very nice thing to write down. So the next best thing is a generating function. So if we can't find a formula for P of n, maybe we can at least find a formula for its generating function. And this does turn out to be a very powerful tool for understanding it. So we define P of x to be the generating function of this coefficient sequence. So we put 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 15, et cetera, as the coefficients of an infinite series in x. So we're going to study this generating function, but first we want to 
um, break it down and think of it as yet another, think of partitions in yet another way. So in order to get a handle on the generating function, let's think of a partition of n as a way of making change for n cents with any number of coins of any value. So remember when we did the making change problems and we had some amount of pennies, some amount of nickels, some amount of dimes, et cetera. Now we're pretending there's not just pennies, there's also two cent coins and three cent coins and so on. And you have as many coins as you want of each type. And, you put, and when you put them together to add up to n, that is a partition of n. It's a way of adding up to n. So if we encode how many pennies do we have, remember we encoded that by a, a, a polynomial or series, one plus x plus x squared plus x cubed, et cetera, where if we took, say, the x cubed term, that indicates that we took three pennies. And in, for the two cent coins, we do one plus x squared plus x to the fourth plus x to the sixth, because if we, say, took three um, two cent coins, that would add up to six cents. That would be the x to the sixth term, and so on. And by the geometric for series formulas, we get one over one minus x, one over one minus x squared, in general, one over one minus x to the i for, our, for the generating function encoding the number of cents you can get with, certain, with just one fixed coin. And you multiply them all together to get the whole generating function, just like we did when we did the making change problems with just polynomials. So that means we do have a, it, it, it's at least an infinite product formula for the generating function for p of x. And so it's the, it's the product of one over one minus x times one over one minus x squared times one over one minus x cubed, et cetera, which at first glance doesn't seem all that helpful because it's an infinite product and how are we supposed to compute an infinite product? But the point is for any given coefficient, we don't need to use all infinite number of, of, of terms in this product. If we just, for instance, want to know how many partitions of three there are, we want the coefficient of x to the third in this product. And let's see how this corresponds to the coefficient here. So one over one minus x, we're gonna expand out all of these um, generating functions, one plus x plus x squared plus x cubed, et cetera. Same for squared and cubed and to the fourth and to the fifth. So first of all, when we choose one term from each of these factors to make an x cubed, we can't choose an x to the fourth or an x to the fifth or an x to the sixth or let alone an x to the 10th. That's too much already. So we have to choose the coefficient one from all the factors after the first three. And so in other words, the first three factors are really the only ones that matter for finding the coefficient of x cubed. And so now we ask how many ways can we make a total of x cubed by multiplying one term from this and one term from this and one term from that. One way is one times one times x cubed and then the rest ones. So I wrote that down here. Another way would be to take say the x from here and the x squared from there and the one from there and the rest ones because x times x squared is x cubed. So let's write down that possibility as well. One times x times x squared and then times, or sorry, x times x squared times one times the rest of the ones from all the other factors. And there's yet another possibility because there's an x cubed over here we could use. So there's x cubed and then we could just use all the ones from all the other factors. x cubed times one times one times one times one, et cetera, is just x cubed. And so that gives us our third possibility, x cubed times one times one times one times one, et cetera. And so we'll see that there's a coefficient of three in, um, in the expansion of this generating function, the coefficient of x cubed, first of all, is well-defined, even though it's an infinite product. And you can see that it's gonna be well-defined in general. And that coefficient is three, and that is the number of partitions of three. Now, which partitions do these correspond to? Let's think about that a little more. So again, we can ignore these factors. Let's ignore these ones after the first three things that we chose. And this one times one times x to the third really indicates that I'm taking no one cent coins and no two cent coins and one three cent coin to make three cents. And so that's, that corresponds to the partition three, um, where I just take one part of size three. Whereas this one says I have one two cent coin and one one cent coin, so I make that the partition two comma one. And the x to the third coming from the first factor means I have three one cent coins. So it, in other words, it corresponds to the partition with three ones, one, 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 indicating that I have a penny and a penny and another penny in my collection. 
So that's how the, the coefficients in general, you can see this pattern will continue and the coefficient of X to the N in this big product is always finite and it's always the number of partitions of N. Now that infinite series, not only is it useful for computing the, the um, number of partitions, but we can also prove theorems, enumerative theorems about enumerating partitions um, using generating functions like these. And as a simple example of, of where this comes up as, as one that's pretty intuitive, there's a very nice correspondence between two different types of partitions. So first we're gonna define Q of N to be the number of partitions of N into distinct parts. So in other words, you're not allowed to use a coin more than once. You're not allowed to have two ones or two twos or anything like that. Let's look at Q of five. Um, the number, how, can, how many ways can we write five as a, as a sum of other numbers where you don't use any number more than once? Well, now you only have the options five, four comma one, and three comma two. Indeed, just to check, let's write out all the other partitions of five. Three comma one comma one doesn't work because there's two ones. Um, you also could have things like two comma two comma one, two plus two plus one is five, but um, that has two twos in it. So we also don't use that one. Um, two one 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 is no good. There's more than one one and obviously all ones um, is too much. So we wrote out the seven partitions of five here. So P of five is seven, but Q of five is only three because only three of them survive um, if we get rid of all the duplicates. So now O of N, we define to be the number of partitions of N into odd parts. So how many ways can we write five as a sum of odd numbers? Now you can use some odd numbers more than once in this problem, um, but you're not allowed to use any even numbers. So you can't have like two comma two comma one because that has an even number in it. And if you observe the ones that have no even numbers are just five, three, one, one, and one, 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 one. And so O of five is also three. Now it could be a coincidence that these two numbers are both three, but in fact, it's not. The number of partitions into distinct parts equals the number of partitions into odd parts of any, for any positive integer n, which is a really remarkable property. And there's a beautiful proof of this using these kind of infinite product generating functions that we saw for P of n. So let's consider their generating functions. So remember Q of n means distinct parts and O of n means odd parts. And let's first look at big Q of X being the generating function for the sequence of the numbers of partitions into distinct parts. So by a similar reasoning to what we did with the coin counting um, problem, but the making change problems before, if we're only allowed one, at mo either zero or one pennies and zero or one two cent coins and zero or one three cent coins and so on, you just don't have any more of those terms in that infinite summation that we had before. You just stop at one plus X and then you multiply that by one plus X squared, multiply that by one plus X cubed, et cetera. And you can see that that's gonna be, you know, a way of choosing one term from each of these factors will be a way of choosing which coins you use to make your partitions of N in the coefficient. So we have another infinite product uh, factorization for Q of N. And similarly for O of N, if we only wanna use odd parts, then um, to, to factor that generating function, well, now you can use as many pennies as you want, one plus X plus X squared plus X cubed, et cetera. You can use as many three cent coins as you want. So here's the geometric series for three cent coins. Here's the one for five cent coins and so on for seven, nine, 11, all the odd numbers. And you just got rid of all the even numbered um, ones. So we can use the geometric series formulas, of course, to simplify these. One over one minus X, one over one minus X cubed, one over one minus X to the fifth. And now we wanna show that this generating function actually equals this factored generating function. Now they don't look alike at first, but with a little bit of manipulation, you'll see how they are actually exactly the same thing. So one, one possible way of doing this is to um, multiply the top and bottom of this uh, formula by, by the even numbered one minus X to the even numbers. So one minus X squared over one minus X squared, one minus X to the fourth over one minus X to the fourth, et cetera. What that's doing is making this denominator now not just have all the odd number powers of X, but all the powers of X altogether. And now in the numerator, um, we can factor one minus X squared as we can think of it as one squared minus X squared. And by the difference of two squares formula, which is a famous factorization formula. Um, one squared minus X squared factors as one minus X times one plus X. 
And one squared minus x to the fourth, thinking of this as x squared squared, that's one minus x squared times one plus x squared. And then we get one minus x cubed times one plus x cubed and so on. And now we, we can re-cancel, but in a different way. One minus x cancels with the one minus x and the one minus x squared cancels with this one minus x squared. And this one minus x cubed cancels with this one minus x cubed and so on. And when we do that, let's see what's left. Notice that everything in the bottom is getting crossed off one by one. And every other term in the top is getting crossed off one by one. And what we're left with is one plus x, one plus x squared, one plus x cubed, and so on, which is exactly what we wanted for, to match the q of x formula up there. So that means o of x is actually equal to q of x. And when two generating functions are equal, that means each coefficient has to be equal when you write it out as a power series. And that means the nth coefficient, o of n, equals the nth coefficient of q of x, which is q of n for all n. And so that proves, just using generating functions in algebra, that the number of partitions into odd parts equals the number of partitions into distinct parts for any positive integer n. So now you try. See if you can come up with a bijective or combinatorial proof that q of n equals o of n for all n. So the proof above seemed maybe a little bit magical, maybe a little bit like cheating. So it's always fun to convince yourself that there is something combinatorial going on. Um, and this will be a little bit harder of a proof than the algebraic proof, but it is still, it's fun, it's fun to work on. So try to show that the number, that there's a bijection between the partitions of n into distinct parts um, and the partitions of n into odd parts. How can you match them up? Maybe start with some, uh, some simple, small values of n and, and try to match them up. So that's all for today. And that wraps up the semester. It was a pleasure making these videos and I'll see you in class.